bless you. God is good and God is gracious. This is what the word of the Lord says as we receive our morning tithe and offering. Isaac sowed in the land of famine and received the same year a hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him. You know, the Lord's blessed you today. And the man waxed great. And the man waxed great. God's put greatness in us to be a great people. And he went forward. We're going forward. And he went forward. And he grew until he became very great. He had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and great store of servants. And the Philistines envied him. All the wells which are in his uh, servants that his servants had digged in the days of Abraham, the father of the Philistines, had stopped up and filled them with earth. But he went back and opened those wells again. God wants us to walk in these things. Now, here's the thing. The difference between motivation and expectation, people get confused here. When you sow a seed, you know why you give? Because you love. Amen. Motivation. Amen. We, we give because we love. I love God, I love His house, I love His word, I give. Expectation is to believe His word. Now, which one does God want you to have? Both. Both. Expectation is from the Lord. And so the farmer that plants has an expectation of great harvest. So we have expectation of God honoring our financial seed. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you. I'm about to sow a seed. Your word says that my seed sown is multiplied. Yes, and I thank yes, you that my finances are multiplied. Yes. I thank you that you're causing me to wax great, to yes. go forward, yes. blessing me with material possessions so that I can bless others, yes. causing me to increase on all fronts, yes. in yes. every dimension, yes. spiritually, yes. mentally, physically, socially, and financially. Yes. Blessed and highly favored. Thank you. thank you. This house's needs are met. We're, yes. we're flowing together. Our needs yes. are met. Thank and our seed sown is multiplied to your glory. Yes. And we thank you, Lord. You teach us to be motivated by love, to give by love, but to have powerful expectation to take the land, to possess our promise, and to walk in everything that you've given to us freely in Christ Jesus. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. And in agreement with that, we said together, amen. All right, come bring your tithe and offering and your alms. Let's take a few moments, greet one another, and bless one another in the name of the Lord. Hug some necks, and let's fill this room with the love of Jesus.
cast down and looking within covered with shame and swallowed by sin just turn your eyes to the sky above see he changes not he changes not i'm talking about jesus Yes, it does. Just like the children of the promised land. If he leads us out, I know that he leads us in. I'm talking about Jesus. Right, when you get back to your seat, just remain standing, if you will. God bless you this morning. So thankful you're fellowshipping. It's good to go to church when people love each other. Who wants to go to church with a bunch of people you don't love and like? <laughs> a bunch of stuffed shirt people that don't even like each other. And if you don't want to go to church with people like that, you can't be that kind of person. We love each other here. It's good to hear you fellowshipping, and God is good. We still have a lot of people traveling for it's summer, and I'm so thankful you're here. God's good. We welcome you, our Internet audience. Thank you for joining in. We're believing God for good things. The Lord is good. His mercy endures forever. The Lord is gracious, full of compassion, slow to anger, and of a great mercy. The Lord is good to all. Praise God. All right, this week at Open Door Prayer Services is Tuesday at 6.30. Our midweek Bible study going in this week to the Word of Truth in the New Covenant, Wednesday at 6.30. Today at 4 p.m. is our Ladies' Fellowship and the Book Club. And then on July 12th, Wet Wednesday, full of fun, food, and fellowship. And that's for all the kids and the young people. All right, that's for the kids and young people. We're, we're now collecting school tools for our children uh, until August 13th. And we'll give out our school supplies. And the shoebox goal for the teens this year is 40 boxes. So... We start bringing in shoe boxes and getting ready. And if you have any empty boxes, we want to bless them. Make sure we help and participate in the name of Jesus. So please be mindful of that. All right. Praying for Mike and Wanda uh, in the passing of her father. He went to be with the Lord this week. And we'll let you know the funeral will be here. Let you know the details by one call as soon as I have them. And so we'll be praying for that family. And we'll continue to pray for the Sloans. And uh, for those who have lost loved ones, um, you know, Sam's father passed into the heavens. Steele's father passed into the heavens. Wanda's father's passed into the heavens. So we've had several here recently that have had close relatives go to be with the Lord. But we're thankful God's good. And I'm glad to be alive. Aren't you this morning? Glad to be alive. God's good. All right, let's say it together. We're a family church, a Bible training center. We're changing Lancaster, South Carolina. And we are excited about Jesus. Come on, give Jesus a praise. Our vision is Jesus Christ. Our mission is to preach, teach, and exalt the Lord Jesus Christ in all the fullness of His glory and power and to radiate His love to our community and unto all the world. Amen. Now, we agree with that. We should be looking at Jesus today. We should be listening to Jesus, learning Jesus, loving Jesus and living Jesus today. Father, thank you now for your precious word. We open it with great respect and honor. This is your word. God breathed, God inspired revelation. What we read, we're going to believe. What we believe, we're going to take deep in our heart. We're going to pray it, say it, obey it, and relay it. That's our heart. We love your word, Father. Thank you for giving us a Bible and speaking to us clearly through the person and work of your Son. Bless the nursery class, the kids, the teens, 
and our adults this morning as we study your word. May it be a fruitful time, our hearts and minds open, ready to hear, ready to receive, ready to learn, ready to believe your word. And we agree with you today. Good seed on good ground produces good fruit to your glory. Thank you. The word of God's bearing a hundredfold fruit in every person in this church. Thank you that the word of God is bearing hundredfold fruit in everyone who studies with me by internet or in this church. It's bearing hundredfold fruit. We choose to receive it and believe it, walk in it. Thank you for it. And we give you all the praise and honor, all the glory. In Jesus' name we said together, amen. All right, children, young people, you may go to your class. And God bless you. Have the best of days and times. And I pray that you enjoy your time with your teachers. And teachers enjoy imparting, giving, loving, serving and blessing the people. So good to have you in the house of the Lord for morning study and our time in the Word together. So let's open our Bibles, Romans 8, 17. Romans chapter 8, verse 17, quickly. I'm going to read several scriptures this morning. So get your Bible and follow with me. I love God's Word. I pray that and believe that it's bearing a hundredfold fruit in you. According to this parable of the sower, these who receive my Word, hear it, and continue in it, will bring forth 30, 60, a hundredfold. So this is the thought God gave us uh, almost two years ago now. And he just simply began to breathe in me. And he said, tell my people to examine in depth and in detail what I've done for them and what I've given to them in the person and work of my son Jesus. Tell them to examine it, to study it. Tell them to embrace it. Tell them to embrace it until they experience it. You know, you can never experience these things unless you embrace them fully. I make my commitment every time I open my Bible. I'm going to believe what I read. If God says I'm healed, then thank God I'm healed. If God says I'm blessed, then thank God I'm blessed. If God says the anointing abides in me, then thank God the anointing abides in me. And then he said, tell my people to examine in depth, to embrace until they experience, and experience until they enjoy for you know, 1 Timothy 6, 17 said, The Lord's given us richly all things to enjoy. God wants you to richly enjoy all things. He gives you all things richly to enjoy. He's not just interested in meeting your need. He wants to give you all things richly to enjoy. And then he said to me, Tell my people, continue in these things until they become a living expression of my glory. And he took me to Romans chapter 8. And of course, he's been teaching me Romans chapter 8 now for about two years and he just simply began to teach me that this is the new covenant and the height of the new covenant is that if we are children of God, Romans eight seventeen, then heirs, heirs of God it means God has freely given who and what he is to you it's yours an heir is the benefactor of the one who willed the inheritance so you become the benefactor of God if I'm a child of God, born again, then heirs, heirs of God, and then he makes it very clear what belongs to you, join heirs with Christ. That's amazing. That changes everything. That's the height and the zenith of the new covenant, that everything that Jesus is and has has been freely given to us through the person and work of Jesus. Jesus came, took the cross, took the curse, and took my death. Jesus fully identified with me in death. Jesus took my old man. Jesus took my old life. Jesus took what I received in Adam. And through the cup, Jesus bore it all. On that tree, Jesus suffered. And God dealt with him for three days and three nights as though he were me. It's the heartbeat of identification. Hebrews 7.26 states it best, He became us. In the heart and mind of God, God fully imputed everything that I was, my sin, my curse, my weakness, all that I was, to Jesus through the cup that He drank in the Garden of Gethsemane. He imputed it all to Jesus. And then everything that I was went to that tree in the mind of God and it was put to death there. Knowing this, our old man is crucified so everything that was my lot my portion my inheritance in Adam has been dealt with through the death of Jesus Jesus is risen from the dead 
because Jesus is risen from the dead, he ended his relationship to death. Jesus has no more relationship to death. He ended that relationship. He finished death. He put death away. I have the keys of death and hell. Revelation chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. So when he ended his relationship to it, I'm an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. I ended my relationship to it. My relationship to death has finished. The blood is on the mercy seat. I've come to the blood of sprinkling. That is an ever, li ever living, eternal witness to Almighty God that Jesus died my death, paid for my sin, took it away, and it has been removed. It ever speaks to God the Father, and it is a continual revelation of what happened on that cross. Praise God, I died in Christ. As Christ died as me. That is the reality of God's truth. Do you receive that this morning? But now Jesus is risen from the dead. So Jesus took everything that I was. Now I know we've not come to a full revelation of that yet, but he took everything that I was that I might receive everything that he is. So he ended his relationship to death. He has no more relationship with death. Death is under his feet. Death in all its forms, whether it's the carnal mind, sin in the body, it doesn't make any difference. Death is under his feet. And God quickened you, raised you, seated you with him in heavenly places, and thus he has ended your relationship to death. And now the testimony of that death is the blood on the mercy seat, which is a revelation of what he did on the cross. Praise God. And Hebrews 12, 24 says, You are come to the blood of sprinkling. I've come to that blood. I receive it. Thank you, Lord. That was my death. That was my curse. That's where it ended. It is finished. Now, if I could say it this way, at this point, if you ever get this far, most people don't, but we've come this far, then God has to start teaching you all over again. And so now we're walking in the new covenant, in a new reality, in the new reality of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done and what that means to us. And this says that I'm an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. So 1 John 4, 17 says, As he is, so are we in this world. So that's what we believe in Jesus' name. All right, go to Genesis chapter 13. That's where we started, and we begin to look at everything that belongs to Jesus. And, of course, that's an endless subject, so we had to get some parameters and boundaries around the thought. And we are looking at the ten things that belong to Jesus, and you should be somewhat familiar with what they are. We're summarizing what Jesus has possessed in the New Covenant this way. Jesus has been affirmed and accepted by the Father. Jesus has been exalted into the highest place of preeminence. That's number two. Number three, the Lord Jesus Christ, His name has been glorified and now given. Number four, the Lord Jesus Christ has been blessed. Number five, the Lord Jesus Christ has blessing, glory, honor, power, wisdom, riches, and strength, Revelation 5, 12. And all of that has been given freely to Jesus. And based on God's word, you are an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. It is written. So we're not making this up. God wrote that. I didn't write that. God wrote that through the Apostle Paul. So we're looking at the word blessing. In the Greek language, the word blessing, eulogio, is the final word. Uh, a eulogy is what we speak over someone, the final words we speak over them at their funeral service. But for us, God has already decreed and declared a final word over us. Here's the final word. Your old man's dead. Final word. Your old life is put away. Your sins were put away. Your death was put away. Your curse was put away. Final word. God's not going to change his mind for me or you or anybody else. Final word over a new creature. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things passed away. Behold... All things are become new and all things are of God. Final word, you are complete in Him. Final word, the Lord is your shepherd, you have no need unmet. Final word, the Lord is your light and salvation, whom shall you fear? The Lord is the strength of your life. Final word. See, God's not going to change His mind. 
Psalms 89, 34, the thing that I've said, I'll not alter nor change what's come out of my mouth. Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie. What he said he, sp he will do and what he's spoken he will bring to pass. God's not going to change his mind. This covenant's forever. And all he's looking for is somebody to agree with him. All he's looking for is somebody to believe it. So, Lord, look no further. I'm going to believe what you said. Amen. Praise God. So now, when we look at this in the blessing, we've looked at our spiritual blessing, which is righteousness, and everything spiritually we have flows out of righteousness. The blessing of the soul is rest, and everything God provided for the soul flows out of His rest. Rejuvenation is the blessing for the body, and everything that flows out of that quickening life that raised His body from the dead flows out of rejuvenation. It's all ours It flows out of that. All healing and life flows out of that. And then in the social arena, the word reconciliation, which means God has made things right. This morning, I'm reconciled to God through the death of His Son. I'm reconciled with myself or I accept me now on the grounds that God accepts me. I refuse to believe anything that God has not said about me anymore. Now, I used to do that. I used to say things about myself that were not true. But now I refuse to do that. I am what God says I am. So that's being reconciled to yourself. As long as you're talking about you in the light of what you were and in darkness and deception and death and decay and doubt, that is a tremendous, tremendous disconnect from the new covenant. You have what God says you have. You are what God says you have. So I'm blood washed, redeemed, filled and free, full, blessed, my foundation sure. Jesus lives in me. I live in Christ. We are one together. He that's joined is one spirit with the Lord. I'm his righteousness. I'm his workmanship. I am in him he's in me and he's at work in me to bring forth his will and to do his good pleasure that never changes the only thing that I can do with that is not believe it but I choose to believe it I believe what God said because this works by faith so I'm reconciled to God to myself then I'm reconciled in my family I'm not imputing sins against my family anymore the ones you live with the closest you learn not to impute sin against your family. Then you learn to be reconciled in the local church. You don't impute sin against people in the body here. And then you learn how to walk and you're reconciled to the body of Jesus. You're no longer fighting with the body of Christ. The body of Christ doesn't necessarily believe what I believe. They don't necessarily believe like I do. But if it's the body of Christ, they do believe who I believe. That's the agreement. There are people down the street that are gathered this morning that are worshiping and they're finishing up their service because they get out at 11.59.59 59, and they're on their way to the steakhouse at 12 o'clock, I'll guarantee it, and they don't believe in speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gave us utterance. They would have no part of that, even tell you, some of them would say, that's of the devil. I don't agree with that. I talk in tongues every day. I pray in the Spirit every day. As the Spirit gives utterance, I pray in tongues every day. I have to tell people, I don't believe in speaking with tongues. I believe in speaking with other tongues as the Holy Spirit gives utterance. Because they'll tell you tongues is for the Spanish class or the French class. And, you know, that, that may be true. French is a tongue and Spanish is a tongue. But I speak in tongues as the Holy Spirit in me gives utterance. So, but I'm, an, I'm not in disagreement with them. If they want to fight, that's up to them. Some people would rather fight than switch. So if that's your posture, fight, baby. Have at it. Fight is one that beateth the air. I'm not going to fight that. I know in whom I believe in. If they believe in the Lord Jesus and His blood washed their sins away, then they are the body of Christ, and I'm reconciled to them. Now, if they don't believe that, well, then they're not the body of Christ. So we're reconciled to the body of Jesus. Then we're reconciled to the world in the sense that we've loved the world the way God loves the world. God so loved the world. Now, I don't agree with the world, but we love them, pray for them. And then the last step of that is to be reconciled to your enemies. To bless your enemies. Pray for them that despitefully use you and do good. Jesus said, listen, if you love those that love you, what well, thank you have you sinners do that. If you give to those who give to you, what well, thank you have you sinners do that. If you bless them but bless you, what well, thank you have you sinners do that. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless, pray, do good, even to them that despitefully use you, then your reward is great of your Father which is in heaven. Amen. Judge not, you shall not be judged. Condemn not, you shall not be condemned. Forgiven, you shall be forgiven. Given, it shall be given unto you. Good measure, press down, shake it together, run it over. Men will give into your bosom. That's what Jesus said. I want to live what Jesus said, don't you? Now, we all know that that preach is real good. That's good preaching. But 
you walking in it becomes the challenge. So here we are in our study, and we're entitling this, Let There Be No Strife. Today's message, I want to talk to you about the stronghold of prejudice. This is part two. So Genesis chapter 13, verse 7. And there was a strife between the herdsmen of Abraham's cattle and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Pezzarite dwell then in the land. And Abram said to Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, between my herdsmen and between thy herdsmen, for we are brethren. So Abraham's attitude was, Let there be no strife. So that's my attitude. Now I'm going to live the rest of my life this way. Let there be no strife. Abraham had the promise, and he let Lot choose. He said, the whole land is before us. Choose what you will. The good news is, is that you have the promise of God. You're an heir of God. You're an heir with Christ. So you can let people choose how they're going to live, think, operate, without condemning them. That don't mean you have to fellowship with them in the sense you have to walk with them and agree with them. But you do have to learn not to walk in strife. We'll never fulfill what God has for us if we walk in anger, aggravated, agitated state all the time, walking in confusion and corruption. We'll never be able to operate in the new covenant that way. God's called every believer to walk in love. Now, let's read John 13. Let's read our new covenant scriptures. Take the time to read with me, and then we'll get into the word this morning. John 13, verse 34. This is Jesus, the commander-in-chief of the church. A new commandment give I unto you. Stop right there now. A commandment's an order of God. Commandments eliminate option and give opportunity. A commandment will eliminate options but give opportunity. The Lord Jesus said, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Now he put that on a whole another level. That you also love one another. For by this shall all men know that you're my disciples and that you have love one to another. So Jesus just gave me a commandment. Now an order from God from which there's no retreat, about which there is no choice. A commandment's not a suggestion. A commandment's not a good idea. A commandment is an order from God from which there is no retreat, about which there is no choice. It eliminates my option. Jesus said that I give you this commandment to love one another. And he put it on a whole other level as I have loved you. Here's the basis of new covenant walking in love. I love you because God loves me. I bless you because God blesses me. See, I forgive you because God's forgiven me. Uh, I am absolutely consumed with the love of God. He loves me, and therefore, it makes it possible for me to love with the same love that He has loved me. See, the law says you will love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said in the new covenant, you will love as I have loved you. Now, let's get this. Jesus loves you much more than you'll ever love you. That's why He died. That's why he suffered. That's why he bled and rose again and brought you into the kingdom. He loves you more than you could ever love yourself. So therefore, I'm going to love even as Jesus has loved me. A new commandment give unto you that you love one another. All right, let's go to Ephesians chapter 4 for time's sake. And I'll quote some of these and some of these we'll read. But Ephesians 4, 29. Now in Ephesians 3, Paul said, listen... My tribulations that I've gone through, that's for your glory. And for this reason, I do not want you to faint. I am praying to God that he'll strengthen you with might in the inward man. According to his spirit. Then he prays in Ephesians 3, 17. That Christ may dwell in your heart by faith. That you be rooted and grounded in love. So notice the prayer of the apostle was to be rooted and grounded in love. That Christ may dwell in your heart by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the height, the depth, the width, the breadth of the love of Christ, to know this love and to be filled with the fullness of God. The pathway to fullness is to know the love of Christ that passes knowledge. So God prayed there through Paul that we would be rooted and grounded in love. 
Ephesians 4, 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of building, edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed to the day of redemption. Hear the word of the Lord. Let all bitterness. Notice the word let. You give permission. Give place. Make a choice. Let all bitterness. Wrath. That means you're going to let all this anger you've been holding on to. Let it go. I'm waiting on you to quit shouting. Praise God. Let all bitterness, wrath, and uh, anger, and clamor, which always be up about some kind of calls, fighting for this and that, and evil speaking be put away from you. So this is not part of you. You're separated from strife. Be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tender hearted. That's the state of your heart. That's what God longs from you and for you is for you to be tender hearted. When you get hard hearted, you get hard headed. And even God will have problems dealing with you if you've got a hard heart and a hard head. Religion will do that to you, it'll make you hard headed and hard hearted. Be tender hearted, kind one to another, forgiving one another. Notice how you forgive, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. So now my forgiveness is not based on whether you ask for it or not. It's not based on whether you deserve it. It's based on God forgiving me. That's one of the hardest things I've ever had to learn how to let God teach me how to do is to forgive people that wouldn't ask for it. People that could care less whether they, they hurt me or not. But he said, you forgive even as God, for Christ's sake, forgave you. See, my forgiving people is not based on what they do. It's based on how he forgives me. He forgives me, I forgive them. So before you get out of bed in the morning, you set yourself in agreement. You're already forgiven everybody that's going to offend you that day. Before your feet hit the floor, you already make a decision. Father, I thank you that anyone that crosses my path today, anyone that, that you know, fusses at me while I'm driving because I drive the speed limit, it happens to me about every day. I just forgive them. I bless them. I forgive them. Thank you for them. I praise you for them. Thank you. They're forgiven before it happens. You learn to be proactive. You don't wait till somebody makes you so mad your blood is at 212 boiling and then try to forgive them. Can I give you a revelation? That don't work so good. Hmm. You forgive because he forgave you. All right, let's read Colossians chapter 3. I love this, Colossians 3. Walking in love. It's the great joy of Christianity, learning to walk in love, to live this way. Paul writing to the church by the Spirit. Verse 12, put on, brethren, as the elected of God... Uh, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy. That means from the inside out, a bowels would send everything that flows through your system is flowing through mercy. Your bowels are an, uh, an internal system of digestion and operation. Uh, your internal operation, let it be bowels of mercy. Kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so forgive ye. So he's just told you again this inner system now that God's put in you, this heart that God's given you, this new creation, this born again spirit that you have that's like him, this part of you that's just like him, has a system in it to forgive and to be humble and be kind and be gentle. And not to have a quarrel against any. Question, who are you quarreling with? Let me read it one more time. He says, If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. Above all these things, put on God's love, charity, which is the bond of perfectness. He says, this is the only way to be perfect is to walk in love. It's perfectness or maturity. And then he says this, and let the peace of God rule your heart. Let God's peace rule your heart, which the Amplified Translation and other modern translations will say it like this. They'll say, let God's peace be the umpire in your heart. Let it make every call. If it takes my peace, it's not good for me. If it hinders my peace, it's just not good for me. 
Let the peace of God rule in your heart, which you're also called in one body. Be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. What a way to live. All right, then if you will, go to the book of 1 Peter chapter 1. And I'll make mention of these verses. In the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, Paul prayed, The Lord would make you increase and abound in love. That's verse 12. The Lord make you increase and abound in love one toward another, toward all men, even as we do toward you, to the end that he may establish your hearts in holiness, unblameable before him in love at the coming of the Lord Jesus. The Lord make you increase and abound in love. Paul also prayed in Philippians chapter 1 that your judgment and your love would abound more and more in knowledge, that you would abound in love. Then Hebrews 13 verse 1 says, let brotherly love continue. We have a decision to let brotherly love continue. Allow it to continue. Allow it to facilitate. And then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul writes to the church and he said, you don't need that I teach you concerning brotherly love because you're taught of God to love one another and as you continue to love one another then God will cause you to increase and abound yet more and more so God's interested in teaching his kids to love one another and love all people God's interested in teaching you to love one another and to abound a new commandment I give unto you now notice in 1 Peter chapter 1 we often look over this in verse 22 in verse 22 of 1 Peter chapter 1 seeing you purified your souls in obeying the truth so every time you obey the truth there's a purification of the soul realm your soul is being purified through obedience to the truth look what happens when you obey the truth he says uh, obey the truth through the spirit unto an unfeigned love of the brethren unfeigned pure holy unfeigned means without corruption the more that I learn to obey the truth from my soul and the Spirit of God works in my soul realm, I come to an unfeigned love of the brethren. A pure and pure love of my brothers and sisters in Christ. And he says, See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. So here's the command of the Lord. See to it. This is your business. See to it. You know, like when our parents used to tell us, Now you see to it, boy, you get that room cleaned up. You see to it. When I get back in here, I want to see that room cleaned up. You see to it. Peter said, listen, you see to it that you love the brethren fervently with a pure heart. But listen, then the next verse said, being born again. Now, why does the Bible use that term, being born again? Literally, he's saying there, as you walk in this unfeigned love with a pure heart and you love people, what's going to happen? The new birth is going to keep unfolding in you. What happened when you got born again is going to keep developing. It's going to keep moving. It's going to keep expounding and unfolding. Because no man, no man that's born again and filled with the Spirit, no woman knows what he or she has. Nobody that's born of God and filled with the Spirit realizes the potential of what's in you. No one does yet. And he said, being born again, not of corruptible, but incorruptible seed by the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. Praise God. So you're walking in love. It's God's Word. It's all over the place. Look at chapter 3. I mean, you can't read the New Covenant and not understand it. God wants His people to walk in love. First Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. Not rendering evil for evil. Or railing for railing. But counterwise. So he tells you, when they act that way, you act the other way. You've already set your heart in agreement. You're going to forgive because you're forgiven. You're going to bless because you're blessed. Not rendering evil for evil, nor railing for raining, but counterwise blessing, knowing that thereunto you are called, that you should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lip, that they should speak no guile. What did he just tell you? He said, listen, when they're cursing you, God calls you to a blessing. But that blessing is released when you bless them. And if you're going to see good days and live a long, prosperous, healthy life, you're going to learn to keep your mouth shut you're going to learn to keep your tongue and let God deal with your heart because that's how you keep your tongue is let God deal with your heart no man can tame the tongue the way God deals with your mouth is he changes your heart see he'll take the cursing out of you so there's no cursing to come out of your mouth cursing can't come out of you unless it's in you 
Let's go back to something very base. Jesus said, Jesus said, listen, don't you guys understand? It's not what a man puts in his body that's purged out. A man, it's not what he eats. It's, it's not the pizza that he eats that defiles him. That's not it. But Jesus said, it's the lies and the thefts and the fornications and the adulteries and all the things that proceed out of the man, out of the heart. He said, they defile the man. That's what defiles a man. It's what comes out of his heart. And a man that's defiled has a defiled heart. But Acts 15, 9 said, God purified the Gentiles through faith in their hearts. So we believe God, our hearts are purified. Praise God. Now, I love this one, chapter 4, verse 8. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. The word cover there, Greek language, is the word kalupto. And with that, it is akin to and in the family of the word klepto. Kleptomaniac. You know what a kleptomaniac is? It's somebody that steals all the time. So what he's really telling you in the same thought, in the same family of a thief, God says love is a thief or like a thief or akin to a thief. You know what love does? Love steals sin's opportunity. It covers the multitude of sin. Love becomes a cloak and it steals. Love is a thief. It'll steal sin blind. It'll rob sin of opportunities and every opportunity. Love covers the multitude of sin. So John writes and said, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, knoweth God, he that loveth not, knoweth not God. What is? God is love. And this was manifest the love of God toward us, that he sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave his only begotten Son to be the propitiation for our sin. Listen to it, beloved. If God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. But if we love one another, God dwells in us. His love is perfected in us. And hereby we know that God has given us of His Spirit because we love one another. And we have seen and do testify God sent Jesus Christ His Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever shall confess Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in Him and He dwells in God. Verse 16, And we have known and believed the love God had toward us. God is love. He that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Herein is our boldness made perfect in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. Praise God. But he that hath fear is not made perfect in love. Fear hath torment. But perfect love cast out fear. Beloved, we love him because he first loved us. And if a man say, I love God whom he's not seen and hates his brother whom he has seen, he is a... He is a liar, and the love of God is not in him. For if we love him that is begotten, we also love him that begat, and they work together. And so then in 1 John 3, 14, John writes and says this. He says, listen, we know we pass from death unto life because we love the brethren. The biggest change in a person that's not saved when they get saved is love. That's the biggest change. It's not what they quit doing, it's love. You take this old boy that hated everybody and everything, he gets born again, and all of a sudden he starts loving. It's his new nature. He's born again. Hereby we know we've passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. And then he said, listen, God loved us and Jesus laid down his life. 1 John three sixteen. we are to lay down our life for the brethren. God's will, God's word. So we're walking in love. I'm committed to walk in love. Let there be no strife between me and you. So we're separated from strife. Now let's go back to Luke chapter 9. And I'll read this, and then I'll talk to you out of my heart this morning, Luke chapter 9. That's a little bit laborious on the Scripture, but you're not wasting time when you write down Scriptures, look at them, read them, listen to them, because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. So I want you to get this in your thought. God wants me to walk in love. God wants me to walk in love. God wants me to walk in love. Not just Pastor John. He wants me to walk in love. Jesus gave me a commandment. Jesus gave me a commandment. That's not for my brother and my sister. Jesus gave me a commandment that I would love even as he loved me. So then I want to find out how much he loves me, let that love work in me, and then start loving people the way Jesus loves me. I'm waiting on your thunderous celebration and praise. I can tell how excited you are. <laughs> Walking in love, great opportunity before us. Luke chapter 9. And it came to pass, verse 51, 
They were come that he should be received up and steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face and they went and entered into a village of Samaria to make ready for him. But they did not receive him because his face was though he would go to Jerusalem. So here's the issue of prejudice. The Samaritans and the Jew Jerusalem and the Jewish people had a difference that stemmed from long ago when the tribe split and so they wouldn't receive him because he was going to Jerusalem. You see that? And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, will you that we command fire to come down on from heaven and consume them even as Elijah did? So here they are. Lord, you want us to just call fire down on them? <laughs> Every time I read that, I can't help but laugh. You can just see them. You can see their anger, their agitation. And unfortunately, that's the way a lot of people live. I mean, they'd be happy if God burnt the church down the street up. And we'll take credit. You want us to call fire down on them and consume them from heaven? And he turned and rebuked them and said, You know not what manner of spirit you're of. The Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Now, that story has always amazed me. And here's why. Because they were in the bodily, physical presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they got in the wrong spirit. Now here's my suggestion to you. If you don't know what spirit you're in, when you're ranting, raving, when you're in the kitchen rattling pots and pans, when you jump in the car and take off and you just burn and rubber up the road, if you don't know what spirit you're in, it would be a good idea. It would be wisdom from above to stop and find out what spirit you're in. And here's some good news. If you're in the wrong spirit, you don't have to stay in the wrong spirit. Just because you're in the wrong spirit don't mean you've got to stay in the wrong spirit. Everybody has their moments. Everybody has their moments to get in the wrong spirit. But staying in the wrong spirit, that's another story altogether. Your maturity can be measured. One way to measure your maturity is how long it takes you to repent and come out of that spirit. If you go three or four weeks and you stay in that spirit, man, you're just missing God left, right, and center. You're just, you're just missing God every time you turn around. Quick to forgive. Quick to repent. That's how you move fast with God. Quick to forgive. Quick to repent. Not hold on to that stuff. Now I realize this is very basic this morning, but you need to understand a new commandment I've given to you. Jesus has commanded you to walk in love even as he loved you. He's not telling you to do this in your own strength. He's not telling you to do this in your own power. He's telling you that I've loved you. And because I love you, you can receive that love. And then because of the love and the radical transformation power of that love, you can start loving other people. The way he loves me, I love you. He blesses me, I bless you. He forgives me, then praise God, I forgive you. And he didn't wait till I asked him to forgive me. He forgave me from that old rugged tree. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That's where he forgave me. And when that blood went on the mercy seat, he purged our sins, sat down. He forgave us our sins. My sins are forgiven. Whatever I may do Tuesday, that's forgiven. The blood's on the mercy seat. So whatever you might do Wednesday or Thursday or Friday to somebody else, he's already forgiven that. But now you have to be wise enough to learn how to receive that forgiveness, walk in it, let it change you. And then he'll start dealing with you and he'll teach you and he'll empower you and fill you so you don't keep doing the same dumb stuff over and over again. Because if you're under grace, you're not under law and sin has no more power over you. All right? So this spirit of prejudice comes in the church and it has a great, powerful stronghold in people's lives. And I'm just going to touch each one of these issues. There are eight I want to deal with this morning. And then there are four more that perhaps we'll deal with next week. But prejudice is a very serious issue. So the first realm of prejudice is prejudice between races. And that's based on color. If we go back to children's church, we can learn this. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. All you need to do is go back to Sunday school or to children's church when you were a kid and just realize that's the gospel. Jesus loves 
all people. Jesus died for all people and every man's value, no matter what he or she has done, no matter how low they have fallen in sin, is established by Jesus Christ dying the death of the cross for them. Jesus died for every man, woman, boy, and girl. And that ends the prejudice issue between races. Culture makes people prejudice. If you ever go to an all-white funeral and then go to an all-black funeral, you're going to be shocked. You're going to be shocked because white funerals are boring. I'm just being honest. I've preached a lot of them. I've preached a lot of black funerals. They're exciting. They celebrate. This is the home going. I've even preached some funerals of, of, of black young people. They celebrated White people mourn and act like they're twice dead plucked up by the roots. It's a culture difference. It's a culture difference. If you ever go to an all-white funeral, I mean, man, it's white. It is boring. They're going to read Scripture. They're going to give a little talk. They're going to give a you. They're going to show a slide presentation. I tell you what they're going to do. It's going to be about 30 minutes or less. I went to one black funeral out here in the country. I, I went in. I think we started about 1 o'clock. I didn't get out of there till 7.30. We had seven choirs and six preachers. And when it was my turn to preach, I said, now don't hold back. Now go ahead and preach an hour. I said, preach an hour. It's 5.30 already. <laughs> Lord have mercy. I thought I'd be home eating supper by now. They said, no, preach. Preach, pastor. So I got up. And then, you know, you don't have to egg me on much. I, I started preaching. They preached better than I was preaching. They, man, they standing up shouting praise of God. So I just went ahead and preached. They said, preach an hour, preach an hour, 630. By the time we got that casket to the graveside, got it in the ground, got back to the church for dinner, it was almost, it was past 730, going towards 8 o'clock. It's getting dark. And I thought to myself, Lord have mercy, if this had been a wife, you know, I'd been home sitting in a chair four hours ago. Culture. Culture's different. But you can learn to appreciate the good in every culture. You can learn to enjoy people. And you learn, because I've traveled enough and I've been with enough cultures, enough countries, enough people, you learn to do what the Romans do. When you're in Rome, do like the Romans do. You just have to learn. You have to learn how to flow. Praise God. So if you ever go to an all-white funeral, just, just flow with that. Might be a little bit harder, but flow with it. Help me this morning. Racial prejudice was put on the tree. Every man's worth is established by what Jesus did on the cross. And every man in your life, every woman, boy, and girl, needs to be gauged by their character and not their color. There are people that have character issues. There are some people you'd be wise to let alone. I can honestly say I know a few white people in this town I wouldn't do business with. No, no, it's just not wise. And I'm not prejudiced against white people, but it's just not good to do business with them. I know a couple of black businessmen in this town, one in particular, I wouldn't do business with them. And you'd be wise not to either. But it's not based on prejudice, it's based on character. Praise God. All right, then number two, we've got the battle of sexism. We've got the feminazis and the male chauvinist pigs. <laughs> I want to dig a deep hole here this morning. Praise God. Let's go for it. Let's just take the nasty plunge. Let's just go in. Praise God. All right. Feminazis and male chauvinist pigs. I was in a church one night and I walked around the corner and these two ladies were laughing, telling a joke. And they said, Pastor John, what's the difference between a man and a savings bond? I said, I have no idea. They both laughed and said, eventually a savings bond will mature. Hmm. Hmm. Uh. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> So I like 
I like Barak's attitude in the book of Judges. He said, I will not ride unless Deborah rides in my chariot. Deborah must come with me. In God's house, you have to be delivered from being prejudiced. I just don't believe in women preachers. I don't either. I don't believe in men preachers either. I believe in anointed preachers. I don't think anybody's qualified to stand behind a desk because of their gender. I've heard some men preach that after I heard, I wished I hadn't. I've heard some women preach that after I heard, I wish I had never gone. But I've also heard some very powerful and prophetic men and women preaching. You've got to get past gender. When it comes to the home, when it comes to the husband-wife relationship, mother-father relationship over children, God was very clear about the roles in the home and how to deal with family. In Ephesians 6 and Colossians 3 and Ephesians 5, He was very clear about those things. But in the church, we have to learn to work together. You got to stop the sexism. Stop being prejudiced against somebody because she's male. Did you hear what I said? Because she's male, she acts like a man, she's pushy. You got to stop being prejudiced. I said that on purpose. <laughs> there are some women that, that have leadership ability. That can lead. That should be in leadership. So you have to learn how to get past that. Being a man doesn't qualify you. Being a woman doesn't disqualify you. In church. All right. Everybody look this way and smile. We okay? We doing all right? <laughs> Physical prejudice. We judge people by how they look. We judge people by how they look. This happened here right when we moved in this building 12 years ago. We had a kid come in, and I was back in my office. We had a kid come in, and he was a goth. He was about six foot tall, and he was anorexic. He looked like he weighed about 120 pounds. He had on hunting boots. He had a hunting knife strapped to his boot, and uh, long hair had his fingernails painted, had on that white makeup. You know, to me, he looks like he belongs in a circus. That, it, that's what I think. But I got to remember, Jesus loves that kid. Jesus died for that kid. And so I get a knock on my door. Pastor, come quick. The Antichrist is in the foyer. Because he walked in and announced, I'm the Antichrist. And he says, Marilyn Manson is my God. That's how he announced himself. And he had a, he had a little girl with him, a teenage girl, and she was goth too. And so I got a whole foyer full of people out here, full of the Holy Ghost, I got the Antichrist, and I got a guy worshiping Marilyn Manson out here before church starts. Oh, happy day. And so they knock on my door, come quickly. So I come out, and I walked up to him, and he said, I'm the Antichrist. And I just shook his hand. I, I grabbed his hand and said, I'm glad to meet you, Antichrist. I'm glad you're here today. And I said, since you came, you and your, you and your is this your girlfriend? It's my girlfriend. All right. He said, my God's Marilyn Manson. I said, oh. That's fine if that's what you want to do. I said, I want you to be my special guest. Brought him right up here, and I set the boy right here. Her right there. Set him right here. And I said, you sit by me. You're my special guest today. And he sat through the service, and he stood up while we sang, and he sat there while I preached. And after it was over, we walked out, and I walked him to the door, and I was walking him out. And I said, Anna Christ, I'm going to take you and your girlfriend to lunch. And you know what he said to me? He looked at me, and he said, I had enough of you. I've had all of you I can take. I can't take no more of you. <laughs> and I said, but I love you. Jesus loves you. He said, he turned around and he said, I'm going to give you credit for one thing. I said, what's that? He said, you're the only church in this city that would let me come in. He said, I've been thrown out about every other church. And I was thinking to myself, I can understand why. It's not like I can't understand why they wouldn't let you come in. And somebody said, weren't you afraid of him? My arm's bigger than him. I work out for a reason. I could break him in half. The day I can't beat a 120-pound anorexic man, I'm going to give up and quit. If Caleb killed a giant, David killed a giant, I ain't going to be afraid of an anorexic twit. You know, I'm, I'm just, I'm not going to be afraid of that. 
He's just confused. He just needs somebody to love him. <laughs> I'm full of the Holy Ghost, full of the power of God. And in the midst of the conversation, I asked the young lady, I said, well, you know, uh, what are you trying to do with your look? She said, I'm trying to be different. I said, you have arrived. You have achieved your goal. And she said, I have trouble getting a job. I said, I can understand why. She went to the bank. She wanted to, to old people to give her money looking like that. She said, I'm going to be who I am. I said, well, if you, not, if, not if you're going to work at the bank. You ain't going to look like that. Now, see, in my mind, I'm thinking, boy, that's just retarded to act like that, look like that. But, nonetheless, got to get past the physical prejudice because who knows? Who knows? Oh, Anna Christ might be sitting in his chair one night watching Marilyn Manson and the Holy Ghost just come in there. And he remembered Pastor John that I loved him, told him Jesus loved him. I told him Jesus loved him probably 20 times in that message. I kept talking about how much Jesus loved you. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. He died on the cross. Look right at him. Jesus loves you. Who knows? That might penetrate his heart and the Holy Ghost. You never know. Oh, oh you know, Antichrist might end up preaching Jesus Christ. Just keep sowing seed. Huh. That really happened. Chronological prejudice. Huh. Chronological prejudice. The old people... Huh. We had a man here. He kept saying, these kids are getting on my nerves. They keep putting their fingerprints all over the new walls. Look at that. There's a footprint. And it's a little footprint, too. You know it's a kid. <laughs> and I had to take him aside and say, my brother, Jesus died for kids, not so we could have clean walls. <laughs> now, I'm all for keeping the building nice. I think we ought to take care of the building, teach our kids to reverence and respect the building. You know, I wouldn't want to see a kid come in here and take the communion cup and just pour it on the floor, would you? I, mean, I wouldn't want to see that. And I certainly wouldn't let Reese just go in the nursery in there and take a crayon and just mark up the walls. She gets spanking for that because you have to teach her how to reverence the house of God. But Jesus died for kids. He died for young people. He didn't die so we could just sit in church a bunch of old fogies and just get, wait till they get old enough to come join us. Now, and on the other hand, there are some churches that are in a youth movement that have no tolerance or use for anybody elderly. And you know what? You make a mistake when you pass the elderly by because they got wisdom. Anybody that's lived long enough to have a head full of gray hair unless they went prematurely gray probably got some wisdom just because they've lived. David was 17 and killed a giant. Caleb was 85 and killed Arba the giant. Which one do we need? We need them both. Let, please hear this. This is a trumpet. Let there be no generation gap in Zion. Let's love the kids. And let's love the old people. Help me. Let's love the kids and let's love the old people. And everybody in between. There should be no generation gap in Zion. The old can dance, the young can dance. We can listen to hymns once in a while. We can play rock music for the kids and sing gospel tunes with rock music. We can do it all together because we love Jesus and we love people. Geographical prejudice. Boy, you'll hear this a lot down here. I don't like them Yankees. Come down here, think they own the place. I heard this 50 times when I first got here. You ain't from around here, are you, boy? Your name ain't Kato Funderburk. You ain't from around here, Cahill. What kind of name is that? They thought my name was K, my first name was K, and my last name's Hill. I'm K. Hill. <laughs> one lady asked me one time, she said, oh, What's your last name, K. Hill? And I said, K. Hill. She said, Your parents named you K. Hill, K. Hill? <laughs> I said, No, my first name's John. K. Hill. Didn't you ever watch John Wayne, U.S. Marshal K. Hill? Didn't you ever see that movie? I mean, you know who John Wayne was, right? U.S. Marshal K. Hill. Did you ever watch Walker Ranger? Alex Cahill was the DA on there. Hmm. There's a lot of Cahills up in Boston. Hmm. The morning that tragic flight went into the buildings up there, there was a John Cahill on that flight. 
6.30 the next morning, I had a pastor call me, and I answered the phone, because you know it's something wrong at 6.30 in the morning when somebody calls you, I answered the phone, and he said, well, you're still alive. I said, yeah, I think so. I just got up, but I think I'm alive. He said, well, I saw where you were on the plane. I said, it wasn't me. It was a John Cahill on that plane, but it wasn't me. Geographical prejudice. Listen to this. How prejudiced is this? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? I mean, if you're from Nazareth, you've got to be trash. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And you know what? God can bring some good things out of bad places. God can raise some amazing people out of horrible places. He's good at doing that. So I'm delivered from geographical prejudice. Financial prejudice. Are you listening? If you're blessed with finances and money, the Bible gives you a strong warning. Don't be heady, which means don't live out of your head. Don't be high-minded. And do not trust in uncertain riches. If God has blessed you, do not trust in uncertain riches. True story. 1982, Teresa and I, uh, we got married in 81, so we'd only been married a few months. And my parents were blessed, and my parents always were good stewards. So... For Christmas that year, they bought me a brand new suit, shirt, tie, the whole deal, bought her a new outfit. And I had a nice car because my dad helped me get a nice car. And we traveled. We were going to a church out in the Virginia Beach area. And so on a Sunday morning, in a new suit, new tie, new shirt, I mean, she had a new dress on, had my car because we were staying at her parents because they lived in the Newport News area. The Saturday before, I got out and cleaned the car and waxed it and washed it, and I did the white walls on it and had a nice little Cutlass Supreme, beautiful little car, two-tone burgundy, had bucket seats, nice car, Oldsmobile, nice car for a 21-year-old kid. And so we pulled up in front of that church. I preached that morning, and on my way out, going to get ready to go to the restaurant, the pastor and the clerk were in an argument. And I stopped because I heard they were hot and arguing. And the woman, the clerk, said to the pastor, Did you see the way he was dressed? Did you see the way she was dressed? And did you see the car they drove up here in? They're not getting a dime of our money this week. Rich preacher, he ain't getting a dime of our money. Now, as a born-again, spirit-filled clerk of a Pentecostal church, and I'm a 21-year-old kid. And she don't want to give me a dime. I'm out preaching the gospel. I'm doing it full time. And believe me, if it hadn't been for the generosity of my parents, I wouldn't have had any of that. My parents helped me. And my thought was, well, you know, if I come in with an old seersucker suit 20 years out of style, and she had on a potato sack, uh, you know, burlap bag for a dress... And my car was a bucket of bolts from a, looked like a refugee from a junkyard. We'd be okay with that. We'd be okay with that. And I preached there all week long. And by the end of the meeting on Sunday night, that Sunday morning, went all the way through every night, the next Sunday night, finally did get her to shake my hand. But her and her group sat on this side of the church every service, every night, and I had to preach against that and over that. She judged me by what I had on and what I was wearing and what I was driving. And that's a financial prejudice. There are other people that will judge somebody. Look at him. He got too much pride to have old-time religion. His hair's combed. His shoes are shied. Why, his tie's even straight. My God, he's full of pride. You got to get delivered from financial prejudice. One of the most powerful people I've ever met in this church was Marietta Smith. Those of you that remember and remember Marietta, Marietta had property out in the county. Uh, she is from New York. She was originally from here. She came back. She was, as far as material things, Marietta was very poor. She was property rich, but the property didn't have a lot of value. Marietta started coming to this church and you know when we got ready to build this building Marietta Smith who didn't have much she drove around in, a, in an old van that was very old and she used to just I mean piece that van together she never was able to dress really nice she just had just a limited income widow's income she said pastor the Lord told me to pledge a thousand dollars to this building and I told her I said Mary I don't want you to do that 
And she said, no, the Lord told me to. And she gave me $300. And she said, I'll have to pay it in pledge, but I'm going to make sure I give you $1,000 for this building. While we were building this building, I was down there one day. We had a lot of problems building this building, getting on this property. And I was in there wrestling. I just got off the phone with the architect. I was wrestling with what we were going to do and struggling. And Marietta knocks on the door. And I go to the door and she says, Pastor, I'm so sorry to bother you, but I've got these two men in the van and they need to get saved. Would you come help me pray them to salvation? And I got in her van, and I'm not kidding you, this is a true story. It was in 2000, beginning of 2005. I got in her van on the passenger side with her, and the stench of those two men was unbelievable. Now, here's an elderly black woman. She's got two white guys in her van. Two white drunks in her van. And the stench of those two guys almost, I mean, is almost hard to breathe. Had to crack the window to breathe. And she said, these two men need salvation. And I mean, they were both just, just weeping. She had been talking to them about Jesus. So I got on my knees in her van and led both those men. And then she said, I'm going to take them down here to Christian services. And she went down there. And she did stuff like that all the time. But a lot of people looked at Marietta and thought, maybe she didn't have any worth. And she looked at me with tears. She said, Pastor, you're a great man of God. And I was thinking to myself, Lady, you ain't got a clue. I'm in here worried about a building, brick and mortar. You're out here getting people saved. And it reminded me, it dawned on me again, Jesus did not come so that I could build a building. He came so you could get people out of the gutter, so you could bring salvation. I won't ever forget that day that Mary Ada Smith came to my door and she said, Pastor, I'm so sorry to bother you. You're a great man of God, but I just want you to help me pray these two to salvation. That's what Christianity's all about. And see, Marietta didn't have the world's goods, but she was rich. That woman was rich. That woman was rich. I'm telling you, that woman was rich. I preached her funeral. That woman was rich. And if I ever realized, yes, there are some people who have money that have helped us. Thank God for anybody that can help. But you don't ever disdain the poor. You don't ever disdain the rich because of their standing. If you've got money, use it for God's glory. If you've got money, be a giver and be blessed. Praise God and bless other people. Can I have an amen? All right, how about this? Financial prejudice, educational prejudice. We know what that is. There are people that look down their nose if you're not as educated as they are. You ever been around those people? <laughs> uh you know, you can educate yourself beyond your intelligence. You know, you can be book smart and be a dummy. Can I have a meager amen? amen? Now, I have a THD, which stands for Doctorate of Theology. So that means I've studied the Bible a whole lot. So I'm not ignorant, unlearned. I've been to college and have... A lot of study under my belt, and I'm thankful for that. But the reality of it is, if you have an education, use it for God's glory. But some of the smartest people I've ever known didn't have a lot of worldly education. Some of the smartest people I've ever known didn't have a lot of worldly education or book learning. But what they did have was wisdom and revelation. You've got to learn to be delivered from that. It's a prejudice. And I'm going to stop this morning with this one because I wanted to tell a story and I wanted to get to this. Political prejudice. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> Political prejudice. True story. We had a problem in the community a couple years ago. It was about 18 months ago. And we had a double homicide here in town. It was an execution-style murder. And one woman lost both her sons that day. It was her two boys that got shot. They, they tied their hands behind their back, put a gun to their head, and blew their head off. Okay? It was in the black community. Now listen to me. I got a call from... <laughs> I got a call from Al Sharpton's people. All of you know who Al Sharpton is. And I got a call from, he has a, uh, in every state they have a group that do, uh, it's in the black community, they do activism. They do that. It's, it's a, 
when they called and said, we would like to know if we could use your church to meet. We want to have a, a meeting and, and get some pastors together in the community to find out what we preachers can do. And we, we were, and he said, it's what he told me. He said, listen, we've already talked to a bunch of other white pastors in the community. They don't want anything to do with us. Will you let us come to your church and talk to us? And I said, absolutely. Yes. Now, why would you do that? Well, I don't have their political view, but so what? We're talking about two boys that just got shot. We're talking about a mama. So I came in the building that day, and there were some other people from the church that had opened it up, and I didn't realize it, but there was Channel 9, Channel 7, there was Channel 5, they were all here, there was all, I mean, there were cameras all the way across the back, all that, and now all this was set up, and the, and the church was full. There wasn't any seats open. There wasn't any seats open. And I came up here, and so I said, now, one condition, I'll start the meeting. I started. And so I got up for about 20 minutes. I talked about the real need for the black community or the white community or any community is the true gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the only thing that can change hearts. For about 20 minutes. And then they got up, he got up. Actually, the man that he sent was his first cousin. I'm Sharpton's first cousin. Got up, ministered, shared. I was right here. I sat right here the whole time. Nothing was said out of the way or out of the order. But you know, I had a family quit the church over that. That just two weeks earlier were telling me how great the church was. And now, because I invited somebody here, I didn't invite them in to push their agenda. I didn't join their agenda. What I did was talk to them about the gospel. I took another hour after the cameras and all the people left. I took another hour. I went over here and I wrapped my arms around that lady and prayed for that woman that just lost two sons. Does anybody, do you know that's important to God? That's his heart. Then I sit right here and me and that gentleman, Al Sharpton's first cousin, we sit right here. We talked for another 30, 40 minutes. We talked about gun control. We talked about some of those things. But I said, man, you've got to listen to me. What we need is the gospel. What you need is the gospel. You need to understand what he did and what that means and what the cross is and why it can set people free. It can set anybody free if you'll believe it. It sets people free. And I committed a long time ago. I pray for whoever is in that White House. I can honestly say there wasn't a day go by for the past eight years that I didn't pray for the President of the United States. When this one took over, I've prayed for him daily and I'm going to continue to do so. I was in the, I was in the house of a born-again, spirit-filled preacher preaching for him and Barack Obama was on TV. He was giving his speech and this man was getting more upset and more upset. And I said, what is, what's he doing? He's not saying anything bad. What, is he, what do you get so upset about? He said, I just can't stand him. I said, turn the TV off. I said, get on your knees. He said, what for? I said, we'll go pray. Get on your knees. So I got right down in his den on my knees, and I said, me and you together, we're going to pray for Barack Obama. He said, I can't pray for him. Now listen, if you're born again, spirit-filled, and you're a pastor, and there's somebody you can't pray for, I got a word for you. You might be in the wrong spirit. What, do you know what spirit you're of? I said, what do you mean you can't pray for the man? Jesus died for the man. I took his hands and I said, Jesus died for that man. I don't care that he's president of the United States right now. What it comes down to is Jesus Christ died for Barack Obama. That's the gospel. He died for Donald Trump. He died for me. He died for you. The, the blood of Jesus flows for all people. It will deliver us from prejudice if we would let it. So I've seen political prejudice. I know what it is. And God will let you have your preference here and, and understand. And I strongly suggest you pray and vote how you're led by the Spirit according to the Scriptures. Strongly suggest you do that. But don't be prejudiced. Can I have an amen? amen? I'm being delivered from all my prejudices. All right, let me draw this to a conclusion. Let's go to the last Scripture. We got these other ones. We'll deal with them later. All right? Mark 3, 5. When he looked around about on them with anger, this is Jesus, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he said unto the man, stretch forth your hand, stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. Jesus was grieved because of the hardness of their hearts. 
I don't want to sit in church. I don't want to follow Jesus and have a hard heart. What grieves him is when you've got a hard heart. Now look at the book of Hebrews chapter 3. This chapter is marked. There's several scriptures here. Harden not your hearts as in the day of provocation, in the day of temptation, in the wilderness. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the day of provocation. Don't harden your heart. Don't harden your heart. Don't harden your heart. If you can make these things, I can't stand him. I can't stand her. I don't want to be in the same room. Don't. God doesn't feel that way about anybody. That's very obvious from walking with God. There's some people that he really likes to hang out with. There's some people he talks to more than others, but he loves everybody just the same. See, even God has preferences. Can I have an amen? Don't let your heart be hard. Stand with me in Jesus' name. Don't let your heart be hard. I want a soft and pliable heart before the Lord. I don't want to be bitter, angry. I don't want to be hurt or upset toward anybody. I want to learn to love as He loves me. But you know where it all begins with this is that He loves you. He loves you. You're never going to be able to love as He loves unless you let Him love you first. Amen. Now I realize that's kind of a strange message on a Sunday morning, but you know, there's some things working in this country right now that are greatly di dividing and destroying. We're not part of that. We're free from it. I'm free from it. I'm free from it. There's things working in this city. I'm free from it in Jesus' name. I just won't participate in that. I'm not going to do that. You know what? I can sit down with a Muslim. I can sit down with a Buddhist. I can sit down with Al Sharpton's people. I can sit down with Jesse Jackson's people. I can sit down with Donald Trump's people. It makes no difference. They're not going to sway me. I know what I believe and whom I have believed. And it's non-negotiable. I believe the gospel. And the gospel will work for anybody that will believe it. Praise God. And without a hard heart and without being cold or cruel or calloused, God wants us to learn to love people. Amen. You know, if Open Door was known for one thing, I would really want it to be known for, that's the most loving bunch of people I've ever been around in my life. People to walk out of here and say, what those people will love you to life. We don't love people to death. We love them to life. Praise God. We love them to life. Those people will love you to life. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for your word. James and John stood there in your presence and Lord do you want us to call fire down on them they got in the wrong spirit so Father I just thank you and I praise you that we're in the right spirit today Lord I remember testimonies of people like Marietta Smith that have touched my life I thank you Father I pray for a soft and pliable heart I pray that any callousness or coldness in my heart would be melted by the love of Jesus and that my heart would be open and ready and I would just let my heart be tender in your, in your hands, Lord. Touch my heart. Touch my heart. What did Paul say? Be tenderhearted one to another. Forgiving one another even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. So forgive you one another. Now I thank you and praise you, Lord. There, there are some still wounds and hurts, and there's still some things in the room that need to be dealt with. And I pray right now you'll touch hearts. I pray that you'll deal with hearts in Jesus' name. So would my prayer team and the elders come forward, please? And if you want prayer, need prayer, if you're struggling with somebody, having issues with people, maybe it's at work, maybe it's at home, then please let them pray for you today because God's interested in getting you some help. God wants you to walk in love.
walk in it. No, I haven't perfected it yet, but I'm a lot further along than I used to be. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Now, Father, we set ourselves in agreement with your word. My opening prayer as we begin to look in your word was, Lord, what we read, we'll believe it. We'll pray it. We'll say it. We'll obey it. We'll relay it. Lord, I thank you for helping this church to walk in love, to abound in love, to increase in love one to another and toward all men. That you make this a place of reconciliation, a place of blessing and favor. Thank you for your blessing on your people, your presence, your power, your peace, your protection, your provision on them. Supernaturally this week to be blessed, to walk in everything you have for them. To walk in the fullness of who Jesus is in them. To walk in peace, to walk in strength, to walk in blessing. And when opposition comes, and when opportunities to be angry come, I thank you. We've already set our heart. We've already made up our, our mind and our decision's been made. We're going to love as you have loved us, forgive as you've forgiven us, and bless as you've blessed us. We thank you for it. We praise you for it. In Jesus' name, and in agreement with that, we said together, Amen.